All the men I never married, number one. There was the boy I met on the park, who tasted of humbugs and wore a mustard yellow jumper. And the kickboxer with beautiful long brown hair, that he tied with a band at the nape of his neck. And the one who had a constant ear infection, so I always sat on his left. And the guy who worked in an office and could only afford to fill up his car with two pounds worth of petrol. And the trumpet player I loved from the moment I saw him, dancing to the Rolling Stones. And the guy who smoked weed and got more and more paranoid, whose fingers flickered and danced when he talked. And the one whose eyes were two pieces of winter sky, and a music producer, long-legged and full of opinions, and more trumpet players. One who was too short and not him. One who was too thin and not him. Are you judging me yet? Are you surprised? Let me tell you of the ones I never kissed. Or who never kissed me. The trombonists I went drinking with. How we lay twice a week in each other's beds like two unlit candles. We were not for each other. And in this we were wise. We were only moving through the world together for a time. There was a double bassist who stood behind me and angled the body of his bass into mine and shadowed my hands on its neck. And all I could feel was heat from his skin and the lightest breath. And even this might be imagined. I want to say to them now, though all we are to each other is ghosts, once you have all that I thought of. When I whisper your names, it isn't a curse, or a spell, or a blessing. I'm not mourning your passing, or calling you here. This is something harder, like walking alone in the dust and the leaves. This is the name of trees. This is a series of flames. This is watching you all disappear. Um, I was going to um, explain after that poem that I played, I played the trumpet and went to music college and that's why there's lots of trumpet players in that band and then I thought that's no defence really. Um, but anyway, never mind. Um, so I thought I would read uh, this poem uh, as a kind of response to Catherine's um, school bully poem. It's a, a, a poem set in, a, set in primary school. Um, <clears throat> and I should explain, all the men I never married, it started off as this as the poem I've just written, the li read the list of ex-boyfriends, and then I thought any poem with a man in it could become an all the men I never married. And then it got completely out of hand, and um, I ended up with, I think there's 40 in the book. All the men I never married, number five. We hated the way we followed us around. Cold as your girlfriends, the top of your head barely reaching our shoulders, and the smell, not just unwashed skin, the same clothes day after day, the same trainers with holes in, but something else, some animal smell that I thought was contagious. You often try to hold our hands or stroke our hair, or rest your small white fingers on our legs. I wasn't sorry for you when we ran away because you tried to lift our skirts above our waists or when the boys held their noses because you peed yourself again. It was sports day when one of the girls finally snapped and hit you with a rounder's belt. I can still hear the thunk from across the field. I wasn't sorry, even when you ran past crying. At the other end of the track, children cheered as the whistle was blown. My friend said you tried to touch her bra strap, that she'd hit you again if she had to. Brown sacks crumbled on the grass, spoons from the edit spoon raised in a glittering heap, children moving crab-like across the field, and you were already running towards the classroom. The next day your mother waited in reception. She never came to parents' evenings or concerts, yet there she was, Punched over and staring at the floor, while you sat next to her, pale faced and silent. I like to imagine I felt sorry for you then, knowing you had nobody to speak for you about the bat, your unwashed clothes, your hands, the way they could not 
can't stop touching things. Um, <clears throat> so it started off, I thought I'd write a poem about every ex-boyfriend, and that gave me quite a lot of fun. And then I kind of expanded it to be um, any man that annoyed me. <laughs> um, and it's really surprising how many of my friends who are men have asked if they're in the book. <laughs> and then um, I say, what's worse, being in the book or not being in the book? <clears throat> um, so this is um, all the men. So I'm joking around, but um, it, it, the book also came out of my research for a, a PhD about um, writing about sexism. And this is one of the poems that came out of, out of that. And this idea of um, sexism often being nothing, like a nothingness that happens to you and you might not even tell somebody about an incident because it's so small. Um, so this is All the Men I Never Married, number seven. Imagine you're me, you're 15, the summer of 95, and you're following your sister onto the log room where you'll sit between the legs of a stranger. At the bottom of the drop when you've screamed and been splashed by the water, when you're about to stand up, clamber out, the man behind reaches forward and with the back of his knuckle brushes a drop of water from your thigh. To be touched like that for the first time. And you are not innocent, you're 15. Something in you likes that you were chosen. It feels like power, though you are only the one who was touched, who was acted upon. To realise that someone can touch you without asking, without speaking, without knowing your name, without anybody seeing. You pretend that nothing has happened. You turn it to nothing. You learn that nothing is necessary. Armour you must carry with you. It was nothing. You must have imagined it. To be touched and your parents waiting at the exit and smiling as you come out of the dark and the moment being hardly worth telling. What am I saying? You're 15 and he is a man. Imagine being him on that rare day of summer. The bulge of car keys makes it difficult to sit, so he gives them to a bored attendant who chucks them in a box marked property. A girl balanced in the boat with hair to her waist and he's close enough to smell the cream lifting in waves from her skin, her legs stretched out, and why should he tell himself no, hold himself back? He reaches forward, brushes her thigh with a knuckle, then gets up to go, rocking the boat as he leaves. You don't remember his face or his clothes, just the drop of water, perfectly formed on your thigh before it's lifted up and away by his finger. You remember this lesson your whole life, that sliver, shiver of time, that moment in the sun. What am I saying? Nothing. Nothing happened. Um, so this is all the men I never married when we were 11. Once I knew a man who thought he knew everything. I often returned from work to find him asleep in my bed. It was like the sun had slipped itself between the sheets, or a lion, or something else born golden and sure of itself. Even though I knew all the stories about finding people in your bed have always ended badly, the three bears, the little girl with the red cape, what could I do but climb in beside him? He must have spent hours shaving his chest and back so that women like me could slide along him as if we were bodies of water and he the dry and thirsty earth. The man who thought he knew everything never learned that he didn't, and I realised too late. This was why he was the way he was, as if he'd been touched and turned to gold by a foolish, laughing king. All the men are never married, number 12. After the reading, a man waits around to tell me the poem I read about a beautiful man who thought he knew everything was objectifying men. How would it feel if the gender of the protagonist was reversed, he says triumphantly. I reply that it would feel like most other love poems in the course of human history. He says, aha, 
So this is really a very ordinary subject. I say yes if you discount subversion and poetic tradition and female desire. More accurately, I only go to subversion and poetic tradition of female de before he interrupts me to tell me how disappointed he is as I'm a better writer than this, wasting my talent making cheap shots about men. The man in my poem does spend the whole poem naked, so maybe he is a little bit objectified, but I like him that way. I start to write a poem about the opinionated man who is busy shaving his head at my misunderstanding of beautiful men and their complex desires, which I only skimmed over in my original poem by not giving my man a voice of his own, not allowing him to tell his own story. I'm about to make a genuine sweeping statement about men when he interrupts again. Isn't the man in your poem a bit one-dimensional, he opines? Can't you make him more interesting? Just trying to be helpful, he says, holding his hands up like two little flags, like two dishcloths, like two dead moles on a fence. I would cry, no, I can't. That is the best thing about him. Or maybe I'm just wishing I said that. Maybe I just smiled, nodded my head. Right, this is your uh, two poem warning. Seeing as I'm being terrible, I'm just going to be So this is all the men I never married, number 47, which got me in the most trouble of any poem that I've ever written. Um, it was published in the New Statesman, and then this guy um, said, uh, tweeted at me and um, said that it was objectifying men again, that word objectification, and, uh, and also compared it to the school manifesto, um, which I was quite proud of, actually. <laughs> Um, and then, and then lots of people kind of said, "What are you talking about?" And then he apologised and said, "Oh, I realised the poem was not political; it was personal, which was even worse." <laughs> um, and then he wrote to the New Statesman and told them not to publish me ever again. Um, so this is the kind of trouble poetry you get you into. <laughs> I'm okay. It was fine. It was fine. I had lots of nice people kind of sticking up for me. Um, but actually he wasn't the first man to say that about this poem. Oh that was it, he said it was calling for the annihilation of men as well. And there are quite a few men in the audience, so I'm a little bit worried about you all. So you might need to clutch someone. Um, I'm leaving a cat here in case anyone wants to run out and take it. it. Honestly it's not even I thought, what is he going to do when he reads the other 47? He's going to lose his mind. Like. Um, anyway, all the men I never married number 46. I let a man into my room because I couldn't bear the thought of him with someone else. Even though he wasn't, never had been, never would be mine. I showed a man into my room as if I was selling him the space. I opened the door and let a shadow follow me inside. I didn't turn on the light. I turned on every light. I allowed a man into my room and he was kind. I let a man follow me to my room and didn't close the door in time. I let a man push past me through the door and told myself I didn't really mind. I let a man into my room which turned into a lift and we were together then apart and together then apart depending on whether the door was open wide. I let a man into my body and let him sleep inside my room. I let him in, I let him in. I said that he could do those things, but only in my mind. I let a man into my room and took a vow of silence, took a vow of there's no turning back, because a mind is not for changing. The men inside my room do not like leaving. They think they know my name, but one of us is lying. I step across the threshold. I follow them inside. Once they're in, they're in. I open, then I close my eyes. Just checking on them. <laughs> They're all okay. There's not even been any slumping or anything. Um, thank you, Poets and Ways, for inviting me to read and to judge the competition. I had such an amazing time um, reading all of those poems. And congratulations again to Catherine and Isabel. Um, she is precious. <laughs> um, so, this is um, the last poem in the book. This is um, 
when I was first starting out as a, as a new poet, I went on a residential course with two amazing teachers, a woman and a man. And um, the poem is really about this kind of complexity of that you can be an amazing teacher and even a nice person and also a complete misogynist as well. Both of those things can exist. Um, and it's how we, how we negotiate that. Um, <clears throat> and this, this male tutor, uh, I took a poem about my mother's hair, and he said, don't, uh, you might as well just chuck that away. It's, nobody's interested in those sorts of things. It's women's business. And I listened, I chucked a poem away, and it took me 10, 12 years to write it. And this is it. All the men I never married when were 48. When he told me not to tell the story of my mother's hair, I was obedient for many years, until I saw the video of wild horses in Patagonia, tamed by increments over many days. The gaucho calm and still when the horse met his gaze, then shooing it as it looks away. And so the horse learns that only when it gives its whole attention to this man will it ever feel peace again. And of course, my mother is not a horse. She would never be fooled by such a trick. But maybe the man who told me not to tell is the gaucho. Maybe once I was a horse to spend all these years listening to his voice. He told me this was women's business that the world was not interested in such things. He said, listen to me, read Elliot, until you fall asleep, or until the red wine runs out. And so we did, all of us who had gathered there to learn. He stood in front of the car curved window, the bats crisscrossed the lawn. He did not hold a book or open his eyes to see if we were there. The room took his voice and gave it back to every corner. It felt as if he whispered in my ear. I have held my tongue for years. My mother's hair. I did as I was told. She sat for hours between my legs as if she was the child and I the mother. I straightened her hair, every curl and kink, dividing it into smaller and smaller sections. The hiss of steam, the TV in the background. My father elsewhere, and part of me still there. Part of me in the library with the man who told me not to speak about such things. The lawn, the drifting dust, the bats, my mother's hair, my hands, that house, the shudder of a horse's flank. Thank you.